So I want to start with the words of Jessica Littman, who in 1994 wrote this in an article titled The Exclusive Right to Read. Jessica wrote, at the turn of the century, US copyright law was technical, inconsistent, and difficult to understand, but it didn't apply to very many people or very many things. If one were an author or publisher of books, maps, charts, paintings, sculpture, photographs, or sheet music, a playwright or producer of plays, or a printer, the copyright law bore on one's business. Booksellers, piano roll and phonograph record publishers, motion picture producers, musicians, scholars, members of Congress, and ordinary citizens, however, could go about their business without ever encountering a copyright problem. Ninety years later, the U.S. copyright law is even more technical, inconsistent, and difficult to understand. More importantly, it touches everyone and everything. Technology, heedless of law, has developed modes that insert multiple acts of reproduction and transmission, potentially actionable events under the copyright statute, into commonplace daily transactions. Most of us can no longer spend even an hour without colliding with the copyright law. In 1906, this man, John Philip Sousa, traveled to this place, the United States Congress, to talk about this technology, what he called the talking machines. Sousa was not a fan of the talking machines. This is what he had to say. These talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy, in front of every house in the summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. Today you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left, Sousa said. The vocal cords will be eliminated by a process of evolution, as was the tale of man when he came from the ape. Now this is the picture I want you to focus on, this picture of young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. This is a picture of culture. We could call it, using modern computer terminology, a kind of read-write culture. It's a culture where people participate in the creation and recreation of their culture. In that sense, it's read-write. And Sousa's fear was that we would lose the capacity to engage in this read-write creativity because of these infernal machines. They would take it away, displace it, and in its place, we'd have the opposite of read-write creativity, what we could call, using modern computer terminology, a kind of read-only culture. A culture where creativity is consumed, but the consumer is not a creator. A culture, in this sense, that's top-down where the vocal cords of the millions of ordinary people have been lost. Now, if you look back at culture in the 20th century, at least in what we call the developed world, it's hard not to conclude that John Philip Sousa was right. Never before in the history of human culture had its production become as concentrated. Never before had it become as professionalized. Never before had the creativity of ordinary creators been as effectively displaced and displaced, as he said, because of these infernal machines. A technology, the technology of broadcasting and vinyl records had produced this passive consuming culture. It's a technology that enabled efficient consumption, what we could call reading, but inefficient, at least what we'd call amateur production, what I wanna call writing. It was a great culture for listening, not so great technology for speaking, a great technology for writing, not a great technology for democratic creation. The 20th century was this unique century in the history of human culture where culture had become re read only against a background of read-write creativity since the beginning of human culture. Okay, that's the introduction to an argument I want to make here today. And the argument invokes an idea that my friend and colleague Jamie Boyle has been speaking of for more than a decade. 
So this idea is that we recognize first that creativity happens within an ecology, an ecology, an environment that sets the conditions of exchange. And number two, these ecologies are importantly different. There are different ecologies of creativity. Some of these ecologies have money at the core. Others don't have money at the core. And some have money and practices that don't depend upon money right at the core. They are different ecologies of creativity. So think about the professional ecologies of creativity, the ecologies that the Beatles or uh, Dylan or John Philip Sousa created for. For these ecologies, the control of the creativity is important to assure the necessary compensation that the artist needs to create the incentives for that artist to create. In these professional ecologies, these ecologies depend upon an effective and efficient system of copyright. But in what we could call an amateur ecology of creativity, by which I don't mean amateurish, instead I mean an ecology where the creator creates for the love of the creativity and not for the money. In that kind of ecology, an ecology that lives within what we could call, following Yochai Benchler, uh, the sharing economy, that's the economy that children live within, or friends live within, or lovers live within. In those kinds of economies, for these, people don't use money to express value and to set the terms um, of their exchange. Indeed, if you introduced money into those sharing economies, you would radically change the character of those economies. So imagine friends inviting the other for lunch the following week, and the answer is, sure, how about for 50 bucks? <laughs> or imagining dropping love, uh, money right into the middle of this kind of relationship. We radically transform it into something very different. The point is to recognize how creativity in many contexts, and the context Sousa was romanticizing, is a creativity that exists outside of an economy of cash. In this sense, this amateur ecology depends not upon control and copyright, but it instead depends upon this opportunity for free use and sharing. And then finally, think about the scientific ecology of creativity, of the scientist or the educator or the scholar. This very interesting picture here of the 16th century scholar. Notice the kind of guilty look on his face and look down and see exactly what he's doing. He's copying from that book. He's just a pirate from long ago, this scholar here, right? Because, of course, scholarship is and has always been this activity of creating within a mixed economy of free and paid. The creator here has a love for his or her creativity, a love that exceeds how much he or, her is, uh, she, or she is paid. But it's that economy that defines the mixed ecology of scientific knowledge. This ecology depends not upon exclusive control, but both on free and fair use of creative work that is built upon and then spread. Now the key here is to recognize that these ecologies coexist. They complement each other. And here's the critical point. A copyright system must support each of these separate ecologies. It's not enough for it to support one and destroy the others. It must support each of them. It must support the professional ecology of creativity through adequate and efficient incentives. But it must also support the amateur and scientific ecologies of creativity through essential freedoms that they depend upon. Or again, more graphically, copyright needs to do two things, not just one. It needs to provide the incentives that the professionals need while protecting the freedoms that the amateur and scientific creations need. So these ecologies change. Technologies change them. Technologies of broadcasting and vinyl change them in the way that Sousa 
feared, governments change them. Think about the Chinese government's relationship to the Tibetan cultural heritage. Economics changes them, changes them. So in the 18th century, opera was king and singers were troubadours. In the 20th century, economics had made the troubadours king and opera fell into increasing disuse. These ecologies change and interestingly and obviously the internet has changed them dramatically. It has changed professional ecologies of, cre of creativity through technologies like Napster or Apple and their iTunes music store producing radically new markets and radical increase in the diversity of culture that is accessible. The opportunity to buy and consume culture produced anywhere uh, and in any form is the opportunity that this digital culture for, for this form of creativity has produced. In the scientific context, we've seen a dramatic change in the way in which scientific knowledge gets produced and shared through extraordinary listservs that facilitate immediate spread of knowledge in certain fields to free publications like the Public Library of Science, which assure free access to the underlying work perpetually, to an increasing spread of even blog structures producing a radical new opportunity to spread these ideas broadly. And in the amateur culture, We've seen an explosion through platforms such as YouTube's of what I want to call a kind of call and response culture that has revived the read-write culture fundamentally. So I want to give you some examples of this so we just have a clear sense of what I'm talking about. Everybody knows this piece of work by Pachelbel, Canon and D. A teenager sitting in his room, very badly lit, did a re remix of this. <laughs> 79 million people have watched this remix. And more importantly for me, as 79 million people have watched it, we've seen more than 2,600 people who have re interpreted what this kid did in his room and offered their own versions for other people to view and to share. Or here's another example. This video. You! Soldier Boy Tell. Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called a Soldier Boy. You got a punch then crank back three times from left to right. Uh, 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 then inspired somebody to produce this video. You! Soldier Boy, what's so. up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called a Soldier Boy. You just gotta punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Which then inspired somebody to produce this video. Soldier Boy, what's so. up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called a Soldier Boy. You just gotta punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Here's one more example. Um, so everybody should know the Brat Pack, which was a collection of uh, actors who performed first in the Breakfast Club. Um, and the Brat Pack was an inspiration to a certain culture, certain generation. And the song Listomania, produced by the group Phoenix, has become a certain cultural icon to a generation. So somebody decided they would take the video from the Breakfast Club and remix it and create a music video for Listomania. And this is what they produced. Now recognize, of course, this is all just re-editing the underlying movie, setting it to this new music track. So sentimental. And it became something of an icon, a cultural icon, cultural hit. And then somebody got the idea that they ought to create amateur versions of exactly this. So Brooklyn decided it would be first. <laughs> 
then, of course, not to be outdone, San Francisco decided it would be next. of these on YouTube from cities around the world as people reinterpret the same original source and create in this amateur ecology of creativity their own version which they then share and inspire others to create on the basis of this. This is what I refer to as remix but what I want you to recognize is that it's what Sousa was romanticizing when he spoke of young people getting together and singing the songs of the day, or the old songs. But today, that getting together is not in the backyard. It is through this free digital platform that encourages people from around the world to participate in this act of cultural reinterpretation and share it in an ecology that does not trade on money, but an ecology that instead trades upon this activity of sharing. The internet has changed. These three ecologies of creativity. But the question that this organization needs to address is, has copyright kept up with the change in these ecologies? Has it kept up with the changes as they have affected these three ecologies? Now, my own view of the answer to this question is quite simple. It has not. It has failed. It has failed to assure the adequate incentives in the professional culture, and it has failed to protect the necessary freedoms in the amateur and critical or scientific culture. It has failed at both of its objectives, and its failure is not an accident. Its failure is an implication of the architecture of copyright as we inherited it. This architecture makes no sense in the context of the digital environment. The architecture which triggers the application of copyright law upon the production of a copy in a digital environment makes no sense. It regulates too much and it regulates too poorly. So think of a simple example of a book in physical space. If these are all the uses of a book in physical space, an important set of these uses are just technically unregulated by the law of copyright in physical space. So to read a book is not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book, because to read a book is not to produce a copy. To give someone a book is not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book, because to give someone a book is not to produce a copy. To sell a book is explicitly exempted from the reach of copyright law in many jurisdictions, including the United States, because to sell a book is not to produce a copy. In no jurisdiction in the world is sleeping on a book a regulated act, because to sleep on a book is not to produce a copy. These unregulated acts are then balanced by a set of necessary regulated acts, necessary to create the proper incentives to produce great new works. And then in the American tradition, there's a thin sliver of exceptions, acts that otherwise would have been regulated by the law, but which the law says ought to remain free so that culture can build upon those creative works in a way unhampered by the law. Enter the internet, where because a digital platform, every single use produces a copy. And we go from this balance of unregulated and regulated and fair uses to a presumptively regulated use for every single use merely because the platform through which we get access to our culture has changed. This is the consequence of an architecture, an architecture of copyright law and an architecture of digital technologies. It is that architecture that produced what Jessica spoke of when she said the world where we can't even go for an hour without colliding with copyright law. And the collision is a problem not with some generation that can't learn to respect the rules. It is a problem in the design of this system of regulation. Now, 15 years into this revolution, where we're waging war in many, well, in the United States, we wage many wars. But the particular war here is the copyright wars against the implications of this new technology, a war which my friend, the late Jack Valenti, former head of the Motion Picture Association of America, 
referred to as his own, quote, terrorist war, where apparently the terrorists in this war are our children. <laughs> 15 years into this terrorist war, we need finally to recognize the failing, not of our kids, but of this architecture. And we need to fix it. So how would we fix it? Well, I fling myself across the Atlantic to come to WIPO to say that WIPO must lead in this reform. And the reform has both a short-term and a long-term component. In the short term, WIPO should be actively encouraging systems of voluntary licensing that create a better balance between the traditional ecologies of cultural production in the professional space and the amateur and scientific ecologies of creativity that I've also identified. That was the objective behind the project that I helped found called the Creative Commons Project which was to design a simple way for authors and copyright owners to mark their content with the freedoms that they intended it to carry. So rather than the default of all rights reserved, this was a some rights reserved model, reserving certain rights to the copyright owner and releasing certain rights to the public. You would obtain this license by going to our site or a number of sites have implemented it independently, and selecting the uses or freedoms you'd like to allow. Would you like to allow others to make commercial use of your work? Do you want to allow others to make modifications? And if they make modifications, do you want to require that they release their modified work under a similar license, what we call share alike? Those choices produce a license. And the thing to recognize is the way that these different licenses support these different ecologies differently. So the simplest and freest license, the attribution only license, supports each of these ecologies as it produces free resources that these ecologies can draw upon to do whatever each within the ecology wants. The non-commercial license, however, supports the amateur ecology of creativity, allowing people to know that their work will be used by others according to the rules of sharing, not to the rules of buying and selling. And we've added in this non-commercial space a what we call CC plus protocol that allows an option to click through to license for commercial purposes work that has been released to the world under non-commercial terms. So you can release your photograph to be used and shared by people in a non-commercial way, but have a simple transaction cost free way to link back to a licensing organization that could license the very same work for commercial purposes. The Share Alike license is designed to facilitate collaboration in both a professional and an amateur culture. This was the inspiration we took from the GNU Linux operating system, which of course is licensed under a similar copyleft license, permitting commercial as well as non-commercial development, and we've extended that to culture. And then just this year, we have released a, t a set of protocols that facilitate marking work that's in the public domain or waiving rights that otherwise might exist so that work can support, once again, each of these different ecologies in different ways. Last year was one of the most important years in the history of this organization. Al Jazeera announced that a huge archive of video material from the struggles in the Middle East would be available under a attribution license only, meaning you can take their raw footage and use it in your film or on your television station or in your commercial applications so long as you simply give attribution back to Al Jazeera. The White House released its content under a Creative Commons license, Wikipedia, increased, it adopted the Creative Commons license as the infrastructure for all of its licensed material. So that last year we saw the biggest bump in the growth of the Creative Commons license project since its inception, now marking at least 350 million objects on the web. Now my view is organizations like WIPO and WIPO in particular need to embrace this architecture, not just Creative Commons, but any of these architectures that import and assert the value of copyright licenses. Of course, the Creative Commons is not an alternative to copyright, it builds on copyright. It's a simple, valid, and traditional license that had as its primary intent supporting of these ecologies of creativity. 
But in supporting these ecologies of creativity, it also supports a crossover into the professional ecologies of creativity. And these licenses are valid and enforceable as we just discovered this week in a Belgian court which gave this band a 4,500 euro award, the damages award, because their content was used in a way inconsistent with the Creative Commons license that it was released under so that it protects the author to assure that their work is used in the way they intended and keeps the copyright enforcement mechanism open for those who violate or go beyond those terms. Now, my view is that these voluntary systems are not enough. In addition to the voluntary system, we're going to need changes in law, and this is where there's a longer term change that's required. And in my view, once again, WIPO has to lead this longer term change. And I want to very strongly endorse the suggestion that's been made by the Director General that in the context of this longer term inquiry, WIPO needs to support something like a blue sky commission, a group that has the freedom to think about what architecture for copyright makes sense in the digital age freed from the current implementation of copyright which we inherited from the analog stage of culture. Now, my own view is that this conclusion of this commission would have certain recommendations for elements to any copyright system. Number one, that the system be simple. If copyright is going to regulate 15-year-olds, it must be something that 15-year-olds can understand. Right now, they don't. Indeed, no one understands the full reach or uh, complexity of copyright law. I've been studying it intensely for 15 years, and still I make fundamental and obvious mistakes. It needs to be remade to make it simple, and it can be remade to be made simple if that were an objective of the reform. Number two, it needs to be efficient. Copyright is a property system, but it is also the most inefficient property system known to man. The simplest idea of a property system, to know who owns what, under the current system we can't know who owns what, because the system has been architected to give up the, inf the infrastructure necessary to know who owns what. And the only remedy to address this problem is to go forward to a modern version of formalities, not at, the form, not at the moment of creation, but at least to maintain the rights under copyright. And in this respect, I'm happy to acknowledge that the RIAA and I agree about the importance of formalities in a digital architecture for copyright in the 21st century. Um, they have expressly endorsed the idea of considering formalities as a way to deal with the efficiency of copyright, and I think that suggestion is absolutely right. Number three, the law has to be targeted. It needs to regulate selectively. So if we think about the difference between taking whole copies of another person's work and remixing that work, and the difference between the professional and the amateur, I apologize, I'm an academic, I can't help but think in matrices like this. Um, we have a matrix like this, and copyright now presumes to regulate all of these spaces. But that presumption makes no sense. Copyright, of course, needs to regulate effectively and efficiently to stop professionals from pirating copies of other people's copyrighted work. That needs to be regulated as the core area of copyrights regulation. But just as obviously, amateurs remixing other people's work should be free of copyrights regulation. Not fair use, but free use. There should be a presumption that such use is outside of the reach of copyright. And that presumption should guide and encourage this amateur building upon our cultural past. And then in the middle, there are cases that are more mixed and more complicated, where the law needs to carefully figure out how to assure that the incentives are protected while the freedoms are assured. But the point about this model is to see that the objective needs to be to deregulate a significant space of culture relative to the current architecture of copyright and to focus regulation where it can do some good. Number four, the law must be effective. It must actually work in the sense of it getting artists paid. And as any artist will tell you, the current system of copyright doesn't actually do that well. And finally, number five, it needs to be realistic about the capacity of law to regulate human behavior. 
you think about the problem of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing internationally, what people refer to as, quote, piracy, we're just after a decade into this war, a war which has totally failed if the objective has been to eliminate copyright, quote, piracy. Now, I know the response of some to a totally failed war, maybe some from my part of the world, is to continue to wage an ever more effective war against the enemy, to up the stakes, to punish more vigorously to win the war. My suggestion is we adopt the opposite response, that we find a way to sue for peace here and adopt proposals, whether compulsory licenses or voluntary collective licenses, which achieve the objectives of copyright to compensate artists without achieving the insufficient objectives that the current regime has done. And we should recognize that if we had had those systems in place a decade ago, when they were first suggested by people suggesting changes to the existing regime, then over the last decade, artists would have received more money than they did under the current system, because under the current system, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing rewards nobody except the lawyers suing to stop peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Businesses would have seen more competition as more would have been encouraged to engage in a behavior that built upon this type of creative use because the world rules would have been clear. But to me, the most important feature as a father of three young children is that we would not have had a generation of criminals that have grown up being told by us that they are criminals and internalizing the idea that they are criminals and living life according to that internalized idea. The objective of this Blue Sky Commission would be to launch at least a five-year process to map what we could think of as burn two, or I would encourage you to come to Boston and do it in Boston, Boston one, but they could begin to think about a system here that could work in the context of this digital culture. Now, let me just end with one more reflection. So I was once asked to come participate in an event here at the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. Bill Patry, who I think is gonna speak later, was at this event with me. Um, the room uh, for this event is a beautiful room with these red velvet drapes and this red carpet. And the event was packed with a wide range of people from artists and creators and at least some lawyers, all eager to learn how the system of fair use could support their own form of digital creativity. And the American law of fair use has four components, four elements. And so the organizers of this event decided they would ask four lawyers to speak for 15 minutes on each of these four elements. And the theory was after an hour, the audience would understand the law of fair use and go out and create consistent with the law. But as I sat there and I looked out at the audience, the reaction after about an hour was more like this. <laughs> and that reaction led me to a kind of daydreaming, which was, as I looked out at this room, I began to wonder what did it remind me of? Because I knew there was something that room reminded me of with its colors and its drama. And I realized that it reminded me of something I used to do as a kid when I was in my, just out of college, I spent a long time traveling through this part of the world and focused on this system of government. And I thought as I was sitting there looking out in the room, I began to have a daydream about when was it in the history of the Soviet system that you could have convinced members of the Politburo that the system had failed? Right, when in the history? I mean, 1976 was way too early. It was puttering along and working pretty well in 1976. 1989 was too late. If they didn't get it by 1989, they were never going to get it, right? So when was it between 1976 and 1989 that they would have gotten it? And more importantly, what could you have said to them to convince them that this romantic idea that they had grown up with had crashed and burned and to continue with the Soviet system was to betray a certain kind of insanity? Because as I listen to this debate among lawyers, at least uh, those of us in the United States who engage in this debate, lawyers who insist that nothing has changed, the same rules apply, it's the pirates who are the deviants, they might be right about that, but it's the pirates who are the deviants, I begin to believe that it is we who are insane here. The existing system of copyright could never work in the digital architecture of the internet. Either it will force people to stop creating or it will force a revolution. 
and both options, in my view, are not acceptable. We, especially here, need to recognize there is a growing copyright abolitionist movement out there. People who believe that copyright might have been a good idea for other centuries, it makes no sense in the modern era. I am against abolitionism. In this sense, I feel more like Gorbachev than I feel like Yeltsin, right? I feel like an old communist who's just trying to preserve the system in a new era. And I wage this war against these two extremisms because both extremisms are gonna lead to the destruction of the core value of copyright. Now, if and only if, in my view, WIPO leads in this debate, will we have the chance to avoid these extremisms? Now, most people around the world don't care about preserving copyright, so one last plea if you're in that camp, not likely if you're here, but one last plea. We all need to recognize we're not gonna kill these technologies, we can only criminalize them. We're not gonna stop our kids from being creative in the way that I at least was not creative as I grew up in the last century. We can only drive their creativity underground. We're not gonna make them passive. We can only make them pirates. And the question we have to ask is whether that is good for free societies. In America, kids live in an age of prohibition. All sorts of activities in their life are technically against, their law, against the law and they live life against the law. But that way of living life is corrosive and corrupting of the rule of law in a democracy. This entity needs to lead the copyright system out of that regime of corrupting law violation. And I urge after 15 years that we at least start that process now. Thank you very much.